happy about today being a Sunday and the day where we can worship the Lord and read a few verses from the Bible. And I'm extremely excited to share with you the thoughts that have sort of been on my mind the past couple of weeks as I've been preparing for, for a sermon and having different sorts of information speak to me about the same topic and I've decided to sort of bring it to you guys today. Um, the topic that I would like to speak about today is uh, interpreting something as opposed to understanding it. Because of the type of work that I do, um, I have to make a lot of decisions about communicating to very different types of audiences. And so it becomes very, very important to me how people will perceive what I'm telling them, what I'm saying to them. Uh, it becomes very important to make sure that they understand it and don't interpret it in the way that they want to see it, which is very different. And so the problem with interpreting is it has a lot of variables that are involved in you coming to a conclusion. Your personal biases, your personal prejudices, your personal opinion, your personal circumstances, all these things that will affect the way you interpret it some sort of information that will come to you. Understanding, however, is very different in the fact that understanding gives you the knowledge, the truth, and it doesn't give you two ways about it. Two plus two is four. No matter what you say about it, it's always going to equal out to four. And it's very hard to confuse somebody when they've understood the concept. And so, as I'm thinking about this, as I'm sort of preparing myself for this, and these thoughts started coming to me and I started thinking, what, what does the Bible say about understanding and interpreting? Is there a difference in the Bible? And you know what, I've, what I have found in my research and my studies is that this theme is very prevalent across the whole Bible. And interpreting, part of the problem of interpreting is that there's this phrase that says, um, it's open up for, for interpretation. Meaning you can debate it. You can talk about it and you can discuss it and you can come to your own conclusion. And so I started looking at the Bible, and there are a multitude of different examples where people have interpreted what, the, what God has said. People have interpreted and then misinterpreted. And it has led people to very, very dire consequences. And I'd like to read a couple of examples of that. It was very interesting to me when I started reading these examples from the perspective of a person that's interpreting, a person that is trying to place myself in the situation and trying to put this um, sort of idea of people that are in that time that don't have the extensive knowledge of the Bible that we do now, the extensive explanation that Jesus went into after he has spoken parables. And it's very interesting, it's very understandable that these people would be confused. And so first example I'd like to read it would be uh, Matthew chapter 22, verse uh, 29 through 32. And so this is a story everybody knows about. It's where this group of people that does not believe in resurrection comes to Jesus and, uh, and in their minds they have this really tricky puzzle for him and they bring it to him and they, they on this puzzle and understanding and they're understanding they have based their whole religion and their belief and so they have been preaching this belief that there is no resurrection and so the epitome of that whole topic is that they explain to Jesus the situation and say Moses has told us Moses an important guy very prominent person in Israelite history has told us that if a man should marry and then die and not have an heir that his brother should take his wife and bring an heir and so we have a group or a family where there are seven brothers and they all die so in resurrection, whose wife will this woman be? And I can imagine they're, in their mind that they're completely convinced that this is the trickiest situation that they could have ever come up with, and that there is no answer to it, and that's why it makes resurrection kind of absurd, right? Like, who, who can explain that? To which Jesus answers, and I'm going to read, this is Matthew chapter 22, verse 20, 29 through 32. Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry, nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? 
God is not the God of dead, but of the living. And so, here's the situation, here's a whole sect of people, a whole group of people that are preaching this with conviction that there is no resurrection. They base it on their own understanding, their own interpretation of information. And then Jesus comes and says, listen, look, here's the information that is, that's been available to you. You've misunderstood it, you've misinterpreted what it means. What it actually means is that God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. And he says this over and over in the Bible, that I am God of Abraham, I am God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. And this information is available to people since the beginning of time, right? They misinterpret it. Because there's a certain thing that happens when we're trying to get a piece of information and fit it into our own brain, and it doesn't fit. So what we do is we start sort of uh, shaping it. As the saying goes, you, you can't fit a square peg into a round hole, right? So we start shaving those corners off so it sort of fits, and then we say, well, that's that's how it's got to be. I've made an assumption, I've come to a conclusion. This is the way I interpret this. This can lead to this kind of a situation where people can misinterpret such an important part of the whole belief in the living God, is that He's not God of the dead, He's God of the living, and that there is resurrection. Another example I'd like to read, and this one is even more trickier, and, and as I put myself in the shoes of these people that were there, I too would have been extremely confused and probably very, very disappointed in the fact that I've, I've been following Jesus to this point. And this, uh, this is written in John, chapter 6, verse 51. And I'll read a couple other verses as we're going. Jesus says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any, meat, and if any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So literally, their response to this phrase is, What? What do you mean? How can you not believe? And Jesus doesn't stop here. He goes into more details and what we need as we go through this. Verse 53, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. And it gets even weirder, right? It gets even stranger for these people, because in the lie, it says you can't eat blood. In general, much less human. And so, in this, this phrase, it, it, it really confuses these people, and for most of them, this is a stumbling block. And we can read in verse 6, it says, Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And when the Bible says hear it, it usually means understand it. <coughs> Who can take this into their heart and make it there? And so, they hear these words, and Jesus is, is saying this, and this is, all of it is true, all of it is, is, is a matter of fact. And he's saying these things and they're very confused about it because they're not waiting for that explanation or that understanding to come to them as the 12 disciples did. And so if we read back in Matthew chapter 26, we will see that there's an explanation for this and that God gives it to those that follow him. 26, uh, verse 26 through 28. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now, because we have both of these pieces of information available to us, we can say, okay, well, that's, that's not something that I... I'm not going to follow Jesus over because he explains what it is and he makes it very clear that he's not asking you to actually do this physical act of eating human flesh, but he does give you this symbol and he's speaking symbolically and he's saying that I, I am that bread, I am that life, I am bread of life, I am here to give you life so that you too may have it and the only way that you can have it is if I'm in you and you're in me. And the only way to do that is if we're connected. We're connected together through faith. And when we pray for the cup and when we pray for the bread, we believe in our heart that we are connecting with Jesus Christ, that we're coming 
to be one with him through it. And that faith makes it true. Another example, and I think this one is much more dire, and it's, as I started thinking about this, this example really, really sort of scared me into praying a lot more about what I'm reading in the Bible and asking God to eliminate all those extra things that I try to attach to it and sort of shape the unnecessary off and make it very clear to me what he's trying to say. And this example is in Isaiah chapter 53, and I'm not going to read the whole chapter. It's not a very large chapter, not many verses, but it describes the coming of Jesus Christ. And it is incredible with how much detail God gives the prophets the knowledge to describe how Jesus is coming. I mean, it is down to the nitty-gritty, to the very, very little details. And so, this mouthpiece of God, this prophet Isaiah, he says these things, and he begins the chapter with saying, Whosoever believed us. And he understood that saying these things to people at that time was, was very alien. It wasn't, it wasn't normal, and they couldn't have understood it. But God gives this information so that those that seek it can understand it. And we know that when Jesus came, there was a, there was a few people that have been awaiting His coming. And God let them know that He was born in Bethlehem. And so you can come and see Him, and they have seen Him, and then they went to heaven afterwards. So if you're looking for, for information, it is important that you're looking for it to understand it, not to interpret it so it fits your life. Because the Bible has a tendency to speak to a heart and judge us and say things that we may disagree with and tell us you're doing this wrong or you're doing that wrong. Uh, and what we do, what our human patterns usually are is that we grab that information and we say, well, I mean, it could possibly mean this, right? So I open it up for interpretation, open it up for debate within myself, and so I start debating. And of course, because I like me, I'm going to make sure that the verse out of the Bible fits me better and that I am not guilty, that I am righteous in front of the Bible. And so I look at it and say, well, of course, I'm okay. No worries. I explained it to myself and I'm fine. But what happens when people come to God and then when they start, when God actually clears their heart, and you'll notice that the very first day that you repented and you came to God and you started listening to His voice and you started reading His word, the information that was flowing into was very pure, it was very clear, you had no biases, nothing, nothing that would corrupt that information, and the Bible judged you clear and hard, and you agreed with it, and you said, yes, Lord, I am this and this, and I'm not worthy, help me, we sought the Lord, the Lord came, He helped us, we became better, as the time progresses, we grow, we become confident, we start going, no, that's not for me. Whatever the Bible says about this, that's for them. I'm here. I've already been through this. I'm good. I'm interpreting this as it's something for someone else. But when the Bible, if you're to understand it and to apply it to yourself, you have to start putting yourself in that position where you're the one looking in the mirror, which the Bible is. And you're the one looking clearly, not to see someone else in there, but to see yourself in every wrinkle, in every speck, every single thing in that mirror so that you may corrected with God's help and God's will. And so, what happens, Isaiah speaks this prophecy, years go by, right? Hundreds of years pass by, and it starts happening. It literally starts happening word for word, and some people understand it, and some people reject it completely, they don't agree with it, they don't like it, they hate the fact that he's walking among them, that he's healing, that he's resurrecting, that he's doing these great things, they interpret it as the works of Satan. And they say it to him. They say that exact thing, you can't possibly be doing this. This is this is the power of Satan. And you're doing this and you're exercising demons. This is not okay. And so, if we read in Acts chapter 3, when Peter um, heals the lame man, He's brought before these people that are to judge him and to make sure that he is punished for this. And they start asking him and they start saying, by whose power are you doing this? Who allowed you to do this? And so, in chapter 3, verse 14, Peter goes on to explain and he says, but ye denied the Holy One and the just and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. And killed 
the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, wherefore we are witnesses. Paul, in the later letter to Corinthians, he, he writes and he says, you guys have murdered the God of glory, the Lord of glory. You guys did this. And it's very interesting that the information is available to people. It's there in the Bible. And I keep hearing this, um, this phrase, and I've heard it a lot, uh, that there's one person that said, you know, the Bible is full of contradictions. The Bible contradicts itself. And I always wonder, and I, I, I usually answer those people with, because you don't understand something, doesn't mean it's a contradiction. It just means you're lacking the circumstances or the situational understanding of what was in there and how it then later progresses. And so when people make these assumptions and they make this, these conclusions that they come to, they start making decisions based on it. And that's where the problems come. It's okay to interpret something incorrectly and leave it at that. But it never stays that way, does it? Once we interpret something incorrectly, we start acting upon it. These people have been awaiting for Messiah for millennia. They've been awaiting for him ever since Adam and Eve. They've been awaiting for this freedom of sin, this God of glory, him who the Bible describes as the most incredible being. The one who says, I am, I am God of Abraham. I am God of Isaac. I am God of Jacob. I've led you out of Egypt. I've given you the law. I've given you the prophets. I've given you all these things. They're waiting for him. He shows up. They crucify. And it is that misunderstanding, that misinterpretation of the Word of God that leads people to make these incorrect decisions that then have dire consequences. Because they didn't just stop at crucifying Him. They, before God, said, let His blood be upon us and our children. And through ages, they have suffered, and their children have suffered. And it is a terrible thing to misunderstand what God is intending to speak. It can lead you to not believe in resurrection. It can lead you to miss the coming of Christ. It can then lead you to misunderstanding what the purpose of coming of Christ was. And then completely discard every miracle that He's bringing into your life because you're misinterpreting what the Bible says. And so, I'm going to read uh, in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, this is chapter, <coughs> chapter 2. I'm going to read 7 through 12 and then the 16th verse. And this is where Apostle Paul says, you know, there's, an un there's a problem. There's a problem of people misinterpreting the Bible, and there's a problem that leads to these consequences and decisions being made. And he says there's a solution. And so I'd like to read, starting with verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in the mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But it, as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yet the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. In, chapter, uh, in verse 12. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. And 16, for who hath known the mind of, of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Apostle Peter, uh, in his uh, letter, in the second letter, he speaks to the Jews and he tells them, listen, no prophecy was ever written by the will of man. It was always written by those that were led by the Spirit of God. And so there's no way you can discern it on your own. I'm not quoting, I'm paraphrasing. There's no way that you can understand it on your own. You need to be led by the Spirit just like they were to understand. And Apostle Peter here specifically calls out to that and he says, brings a very earthly example to us and it says, Who knows what's in the heart of man? Who knows what's in the heart of my brother, of my sister, of my uncle, of my aunt? No one, except for the person that's living that life. No one can understand their pain, their thoughts, what they mean by something they're saying or thinking, 
without them clearly stating that or clearly explaining it, but we, we have no insight into that, except for the spirit that lives in them. Because that person knows what's going on in their mind, and sometimes even that person gets confused, and it's very hard to, to relay that information to others. And so he leads it, and he says that, so like God, who can understand what's in him? The depth of his knowledge, the depth of his, of his miraculous work, the depth of his power, the might, the incredible love that he has. Who can understand it? Who can understand what he's saying to people? Who can understand when he's speaking a prophecy or when he's judging you? He says, well, no one can, unless the spirit of him lives in you. And so it is incredibly important that we seek the Lord, we seek to understand his Bible, and there is no other way to understand what is written through the Holy Spirit, but by having the Holy Spirit live in you, so that the author of this book, these prophecies, these words of God, these words of wisdom, is within you to explain to you what he meant, what he actually intended by this, so that there is no room for interpretation, no room for debate, that there is actual truth, that you may understand it, and that you may live by it. And today I'm hoping to encourage you guys, those of you that are maybe not baptized in the Holy Spirit yet, or have not sought the Lord in a while, even if you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, or have not opened the Bible and found something new for yourself, I encourage you to open the Bible and pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, I need to, I want to understand. I want to interpret it. I don't want to put it in my mind the way I want it to be. I want to understand what you meant by this. Because today, we're living in a time when everybody's interpreting very few people are seeking to understand. And we as a church, we as a people of God, need to understand what He's saying to us, and what He's speaking to us, and what our purpose is here, and what we're all doing. Because if we're not understanding what He's saying, we're going to be misled, we're going to be confused, and Satan looks for those moments when we're not clear in our mind and our purpose to take us away from the Lord. <coughs> May God bless you.